Hi, everybody. This is Joe Chaffin. I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Blood Bank Guy podcast. It is December 2014, and I thought I would close out 2014 by giving you the second in a two-part series about weird stuff in the ABO blood group system. A couple of months ago, I released a podlet, which is a shorter discussion, on the acquired B phenotype. You can find that on the uh, Blood Bank Guy website as well as on iTunes and YouTube. But today we're going to talk about another strange thing in the system, and that's the Bombay phenotype. I call it what the H, decoding the Bombay phenotype. Uh, Acquired B and Bombay have several things in common, but most importantly from our perspective is that they're things that you really don't see very often in real life, but they get discussed a whole lot on examinations, both standardized examinations as well as exams that, that people like me write. So as a result, it's important to be familiar with them, and it also gives us an opportunity to discuss and solidify our basic knowledge of the ABO blood group system. So with that in mind, we're going to proceed and we're going to describe some things that hopefully will put you in a better position to be able to answer questions about these things and to be prepared should you ever see one of these in real life. So here's what we're going to do. We'll describe basic ABO antigen synthesis, spend about 10 minutes going over the very basics of the ABO blood group system. Then we'll describe the H deficient types and then move quickly into the Bombay phenotype specifically, the para-Bombay phenotypes, and then finally, how, what do we do with these patients? When we have one of them, how do we transfuse them? So first we'll start with basic ABO antigen synthesis. If you're really familiar with this, you can skip ahead about 10 minutes or so. Uh, you won't miss much if it's, if it's something you already really know well. But for those of you that are still with me, the ABO blood group system is built on the actions of two chains and three genes. Basically, there are two long chains that, ch that carry these antigens, um, and they are called type 1 chains and type 2 chains, and three genes that modify those chains. Uh, the first is the H gene, technically called the FUT1, F-U-T-1 gene, uh, present on chromosome 19, and that's closely linked on chromosome 19 to the secretor gene, the SE gene, again, technically called the FUT2 uh, gene, also on chromosome 19, as I said before. And then finally, of course, the ABO gene is present on chromosome 9. Uh, I, meant, I called this just the ABO system. Realistically, we're dealing with two different systems, the ABO system and the H system, but it's easier just to say ABO, but understand that we're going to be talking about the actions of both blood group systems. All right, so how does this work? Well, the chains that I mentioned before uh, come in two different flavors. Those chains are type 1 and type 2 chains, um, and when we describe them, basically what, what I'm showing here on the slide is the, very, the two terminal sugars on a long linear carbohydrate chain. The R that you see there is, is basically a, a, a carbohydrate backbone and it's attached either to a lipid or to a protein based on whether this is a type 1 or type 2 chain and what the context is. More on that in just a second. One of the biggest differences between type 1 and type 2 chains is how that last galactose is bound to the subterminal N-acetylglucosamine. There's, it's basically just binding to different places. It's a beta 1-3 linkage in type 1 chains, a beta 1-4 linkage in type 2 chains, really not as you really don't have to worry about that biochemistry. What's more important is where these things are found. And let's move to type type 1 chains. As I mentioned, here's a type 1 with that beta 1-3 linkage. You can find type 1 chains primarily floating around free. I think of them as type, they're type 1. They fly solo. They don't hang around with anybody else. So type 1 chains float free. They're primarily found in secretions. Um, and when I say secretions, I'm really talking saliva, urine, basically all fluids in the body except for cerebrospinal fluid. CSF typically doesn't have these chains. Um, so a type 1 chain can be found there, but in addition, it's really important to understand that type 1 chains also float around in plasma, where they are not bound to red cells, and they're primarily glycolipids when they're in plasma, whereas in secretions, they're primarily glycoprotein. On the other hand, type 2 chains, again, looking at that linkage between the galactose and the N-acetylglucosamine, that's different. But with type 2s, type 2s come in pairs. It's the easy way to remember it. So 2s, you don't necessarily... Uh, when I say come in pairs, I mean they're attached to something. So type 2 chains are found primarily attached to red cell membranes, where they can be either glycolipids or glycoproteins. So type 1s, they fly solo, they float free, secretions and plasma. Uh, type 2s are bound to red cell membranes, again, a mixture of glycolipids and glycoproteins. 
Okay, now, now that we understand the basics of these chains, what do we do with them? Well, the first thing that hap has to happen in order to make ABO antigens is you have to have the activity of a, uh, of a different blood group system, and that's the H system. The H system is composed primarily of two different genes. Uh, I mentioned those before, the H gene or the FUT1 gene and the SE gene or the FUT2 gene. Let's talk first about the H gene, FUT1. So, the H gene uh, has several different possible genotypes, and that, that just kind of makes sense. Basically, big H or little h are the two main alleles. Big H is the active form, little h is the inactive form. So if you have at least one copy of a big H allele, which basically everyone does, then you are capable of doing something very straightforward. And that, the H allele, um, it also called the FUT1 allele, um, it, it, when it's transcribed, it makes a fucosal transferase enzyme. So the fucosal transferase enzyme, in particular, the fucosal transferase 1 enzyme. Now remember, FUT1 is also the technical name for the gene in addition to the, the name of the enzyme that's made. The FUT1 uh, enzyme acts specifically on type 2 chains, okay? Let's keep that in mind. So FUT1 acts on type 2 chains. And what does it do? Well, the FUT1 enzyme, being an enzyme, it catalyzes something. It helps facilitate uh, the addition of a fucose to this terminal galactose. When that happens, when the fucose is added to that terminal galactose, you have just made the H antigen, okay? So that's the H antigen specifically on type 2 chains. Now again, as I said before, essentially everyone has either the big H, big H, or the big H, little h genotype. Very few people, in fact, it's very, very rare to have the little h, little h genotype, and those are the people that have potentially are involved in the Bombay phenotype that we'll discuss in just a little while. Okay, so that's the activity on type two chains of the uh, the H gene product, the fucosal transferase one. Let's move on to the to the secretor activity. Okay, so this, if you'll notice right away, the chain is changed from a type two chain to a type one chain. So. When we talk about the secretor allele activity or the FUT2 gene activity, there are two main alleles there. It's the, called the big SE allele and the little SE allele. Again, going with the same theme, big SE is active, little SE is inactive. So if you have at least one big SE, uh, then you are capable of making an enzyme. It's, it's very analogous to the type, to the FUT1, um, as we described before, so if you if you have this if you have at least one big SE, uh, then you make the FUT2 enzyme, fucosal transferase 2 enzyme. That enzyme specifically acts on type 1 chains. Okay, let's move up to the top right, and you'll see FUT2 acts on type 1s, whereas FUT1 acts on type 2. So they switch around, and you can that's pretty easy to remember. What does it do? Well, it's going to look really familiar to you. Basically, the fucosal transferase 2 enzyme catalyzes or facilitates the addition of a fucose to that terminal galactose. When that happens, you have made, once again, the H antigen. You've just done it on a different chain. Remember, type 1 chains float free. They're found in secretions and plasma, um, whereas type 2 chains are bound to the red cell. So fundamentally, the SE allele or the SE gene site uh, helps, to, helps to create the H antigen in secretions in type 1 chains, uh, secretions in plasma, whereas the H gene activity leads to the formation of H antigen on the surface of red cells. I mentioned before um, that the that if you have one copy of the of a secretor allele, you're capable of doing this. Well, about 80% of people are capable of making H antigen on their type 1 chains. We call those people secretors because they can make H antigen on type 1 chains. They're, they're capable of making H antigen in secretions. That still leaves, though, about 20% of people who are non-secretors. They have the little se, little se genotype, and we'll talk about what that means in just a few minutes. Okay, now now that we've made the ABO antigens, sorry, the H antigens, what can we do with that? Well, in order to make the A, B, A and B antigens, you have to first have H. I mentioned that before. Um, if you are someone who is blood group A that you see on the top there, then you are of one of two different genotypes. You see the three possibilities for ABO alleles, the three main possibilities for ABO alleles up at the top, the A, B, and O alleles. If you inherit two copies of A or an A and an O, then you're going to have an A transferase. That enzyme uh, causes the or facilitates the addition of an N-acetylgalactosamine onto that terminal galactose 
only when that chain has already been changed into the H antigen. When that happens and you make and you add the N-acetylgalactosamine, that chain changes from an H into an A. In a similar way, if you're blood group B, then you have either the uh, two copies of the B allele or one with an O. Either way, you have a B transferase. And again, that transferase facilitates the addition of a galactose onto that terminal galactose. Um, again, that only occurs if the H antigen was there, it was present first, and the chain changes from an H antigen into a B antigen. Now, what happens if you're blood group O? If you're blood group O, um, then Obviously, by definition, you have two copies of the O allele, which gives you no transferase whatsoever. So the H antigen on the surface of group O red cells stays as the H antigen. Therefore, the people who are blood group O have an abundance of H antigen on their surface of their red cells. And if you look at this next diagram, this will show that. Um, breaking down the four different main ABO blood groups, um, if you focus on the far right, for people who are blood group O, the only antigen they have on the surface of their cells is the H antigen. They have three different antibodies, the anti-A, the anti-B, anti and a weird antibody called anti-A comma B that reacts against either A or B antigens. Um, Again, this should be fairly familiar to you because most of us learned this in high school. Um, if you're group A, you have anti-B. If you're group B, you have anti-A, et cetera. Notice though on the top row there, in people who are blood group A, B, and AB, there's still a small amount of that red triangle, the H antigen on the surface. Still a small amount. It can be pretty tiny, especially in AB people. Um, as well as A1 people, but it's, it, there's just a very, very small amount of residual H antigen. Moving on to ABO testing, what we see is, again, something that most of you are very familiar with, um, the, the so-called cell grouping or forward grouping as, or front typing, as blood bankers tend to call it on the left, uh, is the activity of reagent anti-A and anti-B with patient's red cells. Um, and again, focusing on the bottom, bottom row here, people who are blood group O have no reactivity with either the reagent anti-A or anti-B, so they have no A or B antigen on their surface. And when you do the reverse grouping or back typing, as blood bankers like to call it, which is the patient serum reacted against uh, laboratory A1 red cells and B red cells, then you should have reactivity with both of those. Again, this should be fairly familiar to you. All right, so let's talk about the H deficient types. What are those H deficient types? Really, there are three main ones that we're going to discuss. There are more than that, but there are three main ones. The first is, of course, the, the infamous Bombay phenotype, or O sub H, or OH as it's also called. These individuals are genetically little h, little h, little se, little se. So in other words, they're incapable of making H antigen either on their red cells or in their secretions. And there's also a strange disease association that we'll talk about in just a little while. Those individuals have, again, their the mutations are pretty well described. They have little h, little h, and little se, little se. The second group of H deficient people are H deficient secretors, and these, are piece, these folks have classically been called parabombe or H plus W. Uh, what's specific about these patients is that when you look at their chromosome 19, they have little h, little h, um, so two mutated copies of the H allele, but they have at least one active secretor allele. So they are capable of making H antigens in their secretions and in their plasma on type 1 chains, as we described before. Finally, the last uh, H deficient group that we'll describe are the mostly H deficient people, again, commonly called H plus W. These can be a little bit confusing. Uh, they have weak enzymes for the H um, at their H genetic focus, their FUT1 focus, and they are typically non-secretors. So very weakly reacting, uh, or very weakly acting, I should say, H alleles and, and, and resultant FUT1 enzyme. Again, more on that in just a little while. When you look at them, uh, again, they have mutated copies of the H allele and they are typically non-secretors. All right, so let's talk about Bombay. Bombay phenotype um, is very famous, as I said before, and really you probably already have enough to understand it without me going through the details, but let's do it anyway. Um, Bombay was first described in the 1950s when a group of patients in Bombay, which is now called Mumbai, by the way, um, were discovered and reported, and these individuals were very unique. They were blood group O, but when their red cells, I'm sorry, when their serum was reacted with other blood group O people, which should be completely compatible, there, there was complete incompatibility. The only compatible pe people with these blood group O's were other people that had similar characteristics. 
Eventually, anti-H was identified in these patients, and, and since that time, we've seen it elsewhere. It is not limited just to Mumbai, India now. Um, it's, it's been found in virtually all racial groups, but again, it's very, very rare across the board. So what the genetics of this, we've already described this. These individuals are little h, little h, and little s, e, little s, e. And that's really, if I'm being honest, kind of an elementary way to describe it. Realistically, we have outlined a whole wide variety of mutations that lead to individuals having inactive H and inactive little s, or SE, I should say, alleles. And, and these are just a couple of them, people that are little H. In fact, the people that were discovered uh, in the Bombay phenotype classically have that first single nucleotide polymorphism, the 725 uh, T to G cha uh, change. So that SNP is associated classically with a Bombay phenotype, but there are a multitude of others that you can find uh, in a wide variety of sources. In addition, the, as far as the, the, the secretor or the FUT, excuse me, the FUT2 mutations, the secretor uh, Classically, people who are Bombay, that 725T to G SNP goes along with a totally deleted secretor allele, totally deleted uh, FUT2 allele. Um, but there are numerous other mutations that we've seen and have been well described. The asterisk on the 428G to A on the far right, that's the one that's classically seen in or typically seen in patients of European descent who are non-secretors, that 20% that I showed you earlier. Anyway, as I mentioned before, there are multiple rare FUT1 mutations identified. Uh, it's seen in most racial groups, most commonly in India, one in 10,000 patients. Uh, there are a few other populations that have significantly higher uh, rate of mutations as well, but classically seen in India. And about one in a million individuals in Europe are little h, little h. And the FUT2 mutation, mutations, as I said before, much more common, 20% or so are little se, little se with that 428G to A SNP that I showed you on the far right. So what, what actually happens if you, if you are Bombay, if you're little h, little h, little se, little se, well then we'll go back to this slide that you've seen before. People who are genetic AA or AO on the right, they have the A transferase. So what normally would happen in someone who makes an H is that they would add an N-acetylgalactosamine to make the A antigen. However, individuals that are Bombay, little h, little h, they have no FUT1. So on the surface of their red cell, that fucose was never added, so that N-acetylgalactosamine can never added, be added, I should say. The same thing with people who are blood group B. Uh, because they're little h, little h, and there's no FUT1, there's not going to be any fucose, so no galactose. So as a result, these, the, the, these long carbohydrate chains on the surface will carry neither A activity, B activity, or H activity. And that's really important to get that. So, Because initially they look like they're blood group O, but it's a very important difference. When you test these patients in the laboratory and you use reagent anti-A1 uh, against these red cells, you're not going to get any reaction. Same thing with anti-B. And again, that would just look like someone who's blood group O, but it, when we do something different, and uh, you've heard me say this before, blood bankers are really weird. We, we find weird stuff to react with red cells. And someone along the way took um, uh, the lectin from the plant, which is called Ulex europius. Ulex europius is just the common gorse plant. It looks like this picture. And they ground up the seeds of Ulex. And what they discovered is that the extract from those seeds acted like kind of like an antibody against the H antigen. So in other words, red cells that carry H antigen with Ulex lectin, the H lectin, would react. Well, these cells don't have the H antigen, so reacting the, the Ulex lectin against Bombay cells will give you no reaction whatsoever. Well, what about the secretions? If you test the, the secretions, like saliva, for example, you don't do it in exactly the same way you test red cells. Typically, you would use agglutination inhibition techniques. It's kind of fun, and it's, it's something that, um, well, it's kind of gross, really, but it's something that, that blood bankers like to talk about and like to put on examinations for sure. But anyway, when you do that, what you would see is that there's no A antigen, there's no B antigen, there's no H antigen. And interestingly, well, at least interestingly to me, what you would discover is that when when you test uh, the patient's saliva for the presence of the Lewis B antigen, they will always be Lewis B negative. Um, I did a podcast uh, a while back on the on the Lewis system. I called it Fun with the Lewis System. If that doesn't make sense to you, please go back and take a look at that podcast. But the bottom line message is that people who are non-secretors are always Lewis B negative 100% of the time. 
So when you look at people who are of the Bombay phenotype, what you'll see, and let's just extend this diagram that you've shown that I've shown you before, is that their red cells actually have no antigens on the surface. They don't, they're they're, they're kind of like O's, except they lack the H antigen. And when you look at their serum, what you would find is the same antibodies that we describe for people who are blood group O, anti-A, anti-B, anti-A, comma B, but more importantly, they have an antibody against the H antigen. That antibody is so-called naturally occurring, meaning you don't have to be pregnant or transfused in order to have it, but it's a very important antibody that we'll describe more in just a few minutes. So how do these patients present? Well, there's a lot of different ways that they can, um, but if you look at them in routine testing, what you would see, again, this is forward grouping and reverse grouping, front typing, back typing, cell, te cell grouping, serum grouping, whatever you choose to call it, you would see that if someone like this just looks like their blood group O, you know, no big deal. However, if this patient were going to get transfused and you did an antibody screen, whether that's with the technology like gel that you see on the top there or with liquid that you see on the bottom, essentially what you would see is wild incompatibility with all the cells on the antibody screen. What's important to remember is that all the cells on the antibody screen, all these cells, that either three cells on the liquid typically or two cells on the gel, for example, they're all blood group O cells. So they all have an abundance of H antigens. So you would expect their serum or plasma to be incompatible uh, with that um, sorry, with those red cells. So what you would suspect when you saw an antibody screen pattern like this is the possibility of an antibody against a high frequency antigen. And you might go and do a, a, a workup. And this is an artificial workup. I'm showing you basically the results of gel uh, and liquid on the same panel. That's not typically done. But this is just an illustration to show you that again, all these cells in an antibody panel or blood group O, they all have a ton of H. So this person has an anti-H, so you would see broad activity against all these cells, typically with a negative autocontrol because the patient's cells lack that H antigen. Um, so if you saw a pattern like that, you would definitely say this is a high frequency antigen. And it's kind of a scary one because the, the, the cells are reacting very strongly. Um, it, Let's be, let's be frank. If you saw something like this, Bombay probably wouldn't be the first thing that came to your mind. If the person was blood group O, you might consider that, consider Bombay and blood group O, but honestly, a lot of times people work down the pathway of figuring out what high frequency this is before someone says, oh, this patient's blood group O. Maybe we should throw some Ulex at it and, and see what's going on. Uh, obviously, that's, that's not always the case, um, but eventually, uh, you would figure out that this patient actually has an anti-H, and th through the use of the ULEX, you would see that they lack H antigen, therefore they are most likely Bombay. Um, I've actually only seen one Bombay case in my 20 years doing blood banking to this point, and it was actually not diagnosed by me. It was it was found by by some of the brilliant folks at Cedar Sinai in LA before I arrived there. Uh, people like Dr. Ellen Clapper and and Roz Marfo who who worked this up uh, among others. But anyway, the, the the short story of this, and I'm not telling the full details, but. The, in, this was a situation where we had a group B mom and a group O dad. And if a group B mom um, had babies with a group O dad, you would expect uh, the, the babies to come out one of two ways. If, if mom was homozygous for B, then you'd expect all the babies to be blood group B. They would have the B O genotype. However, if mom was heterozygous, in other words, if she had a B and an O, then you'd expect half the babies to be blood group B and half the babies to be blood group O. Well, this couple had their first baby and the baby was blood group B and everybody's happy, no problem, all is well. But the, the second baby was born and the second baby was blood group A. I'm like, wait just a second. You know, classically, we always say, well, we know mom's mom, but do we really know dad's dad? Well, as it turned out after a lot of investigating, yeah, dad really was dad. Um, and what was discovered is that dad actually was blood group A genetically. Well, how does that work? In other words, it, the, the pattern should have been something like this. Well, why did dad appear to be blood group O? Well, again, uh, the geniuses there uh, worked it up, figured it out, and discovered that this person uh, was of the Bombay phenotype and actually had a strong anti-H. So again, it, they don't always present in classic, typical ways, and you have to be aware of the possibility uh, of Bombay, even though they occur in real life pretty rarely. An even more rare presentation of the Bombay phenotype is in association with leukocyte adhesion deficiency type 2, or LAD2. And this is really kind of a test world thing. Uh, you might get thrown something like this as trivia. The, the bottom line with this is that if you look at neutrophils, neutrophils are designed to kill bacteria. So a neutrophil cruises along, and a neutrophil 
neutrophil wants to get across that, um, across those endothelial cells and attack those bacteria. Well, how does it do that? Well, neutrophils need something on their surface and that something is fucose. If the, if the neutrophils have a fucosylated surface, then they can go attached to those endothelial cells, squeeze through the endothelial cells and kill those bacteria. People who have leukocyte adhesion deficiency type 2, they lack that fucose. So as a result, their granulocytes, their white blood cells, uh, will neutrophils, will come along and they really can't do anything. They can't bind, they can't get through. So you can kind of see the connection, I hope, if they're incapable of, make, of attaching fucose to their neutrophils, then they seem to all, all those have been described so far, are also Bombay. They're not capable of attaching um, fucose to their to their red blood cells. It's incredibly rare. Um, it presents with infections, growth, and mental retardation, and, and the issue is fucosylation of all surfaces, um, obviously including both uh, type 2 chains on red cells as well as type 1 chains. Um, again, test world deal and you'll pro not something you'll probably ever see. Okay, so let's move on to something that's a little more confusing. This messes people up a little bit, and that's the parabombay phenotypes. There's more than one. Um, and we'll talk about the two main ones. The parabombay phenotype that we'll describe first is kind of the classic one that most books describe, um, and that is those who are H-deficient secretors. And let's hit those first. People who are H-deficient secretors, they are little h, little h by definition, so they have mutations in the foot uh, one allele, um, two copies of that, and so as a result, they are incapable of making H on the surface of their red cells. That's just like Bombay. However, p in, the issue is that these individuals do not have the deletion of, of the secretor allele. So as a result, unlike people who are Bombay, they are capable of attaching that fucose to the terminal galactose in a type 1 chain and making the H antigen both in secretions and more importantly from our perspective in plasma. So if you look at people who are, who are para-Bombay uh, H, uh, H deficient secretors, if you look at either their plasma or saliva, let's just imagine that this individual is genetically blood group A. So these individuals who are genetically blood group A, if you're testing their secretions or their plasma, you would see that the A antigen is present because they can make H as a result of that secretor allele, the FUT2 allele, um, and they can make either A, and A or B because they have an A transferase. Blood group B antigen would be absent, obviously. H antigen would be present. Um, and this would be reversed if the individual was a blood group B person. For example, they would have no A, they would have the B antigen and some H antigen as well. Um, so moving on from there, what does that mean for us for these patients? Again, let's we'll stick with someone who's blood group A um, and a uh, someone whose gr blood group A is a secretor but, but, is, uh, but has the mutated H allele. So as a result, they're incapable of making their own H antigen or ABO antigen on their red cells. Well, remember the secretions, uh, the secretor allele causes the formation of both H antigen and potentially A antigen in secretions as well as plasma. So as a result of that, some of this H antigen, a tiny little amount, and some of the A antigen can passively adsorb onto the surface of the red cells. So you get a very tiny amount of A and or H antigen on the surface of the red cells. Much, much, much less than you would have if you were not uh, little h, little h genotype, but still some that's there that you could theoretically see if you test the, the red cells very closely. Now these cells, again, in a blood group A person, get called A sub H or AH, or probably better, they're called AH secretor red cells. And in fact, depending on what the person's ABO genotype is, these individuals can be either AH, BH, ABH, or unfortunately, sometimes people use the term OH or O sub H for uh, these H deficient secretors, uh, it, that can be really confusing because obviously OH is the is the designation typically used for Bombay. So be really careful when you see that particular little OH um, and make sure what that they're actually talking about Bombay versus OH secretor, which is this description here. If you test the red cells in someone who is an AH secretor, what you would see with anti-A1 is a little bit of weak activity. You could enhance that activity by making the reactions colder, uh, by doing adsorptions and elutions, things like that. So, But you would probably be able to detect a tiny amount of, of A antigen. You wouldn't see any B, obviously. This person is a genetic A. Um, and if you did the H lectin, the Ulex Europius lectin, and looked at those AH cells, you might see, again, a very weak amount, a very tiny amount of H antigen on the surface. 
Okay, so those are Parabombay folks, and we're going to talk about the antibodies that they make in, in just a few minutes. But let's talk first about the, the other type of Parabombay uh, that gets mentioned in textbooks, and that's people that are mostly H deficient. Those of you that know my favorite movie will get that reference when I say they're mostly H deficient. All right, so again, normally people with active fucosal transferase 1 or FUT1 uh, alleles and resultant enzymes on the surface of their red cell in combination, say, with an A transferase, they'll make a whole bunch of A and leave a little bit of H on the surface. Same thing with blood group B people, a whole bunch of B and a little bit of H. However, these individuals um, of this particular type of Parabombe phenotype, they have very weakly reactive fucosal transferase 1 enzymes. So they, they, have a genetic, they have genetic mutations that are associated with very weak activity of the FUT1 enzyme. So as a result, they're making a tiny, tiny amount of H. They still have their normal A transferase or B transferase, um, and so they make a tiny amount of A or B on the surface of the red cells. So a teeny tiny amount of red cell membrane bound type 2 H antigen resultant uh, A or B antigen, so a very small amount. So if you look at these folks, what happens to them? Well, uh, individuals who are blood group A, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, because they have such a tiny amount of, of A antigen on their surface, many of them will make anti-H, and that anti-H is actually typically a pretty strong and significant anti-H. Many of them will make an anti-A1, which is a benign antibody seen commonly in uh, subgroups of group A, people that make very little A antigen, but they will also make a very strong anti-B, as you would expect. Of those, typically the anti-H is significant, and typically the anti-B is significant, meaning that they can react at body temperatures. If you look at someone whose blood group B, on the other hand, again, they're making a tiny amount of B on the surface of their red cells. They'll have a strong anti-H that's significant. They will always have a, an anti-A, and a few of them will make an anti-B, but that anti-B, as far as I can tell, is not typically significant, meaning it's not reacting at body temperatures and causing problems. Okay, let's move on to talk about what we do in these situations. So for transfusion in H-deficient patients, um, let's, let's start first with the description of the three main antibodies that we worry about. And I, when I say main antibodies, I'm talking about the antibodies surrounding the H antigen. Obviously, you worry about anti-A and you worry about anti-B, um, but what about these antibodies? Um, the, the one significant antibody we're, we're gonna spend time describing is anti-H. Anti-H, um, when it reacts at body temperature, is very very significant and very important. However, there's a version of anti-H shown in green there that only reacts below body temperature. And along with that is a, a weird antibody called anti-HI, which is also very common and completely benign. Let's, let's describe where these things come about. Both anti-H and anti-HI are seen in individuals who have a very small amount of H antigen normally. Um, people who are blood group A1, people who are blood group A1B have converted most of their H into either A in A1 or A, or a and B in A1B people. So there's very little H. They can form these benign antibodies, They're, some people call them autoantibodies, that react very mildly and don't cause clinical problems. So let's let's get to that now. Let's look at people who are, are Bombay, little h, little h, little se, little se. As a result of that, they make no H antigen on their red cells. They make no antigens in their secretion, H antigens in their secretion or plasma. So these individuals have several significant antibodies, anti-A, anti-B, anti-A comma B, and of course, as we've described already, a very significant, very important anti-H that, that does cause problems if they see um, red cells carrying any H whatsoever. Now what about the first type of parabombay? That's the H deficient secretor that we described, people who are little h, little h, but who are secretors so they can make H and A or B antigen in their secretions depending on their, their ABO alleles. And I say secretions, but remember that also includes plasma. So as a result of that, a little bit of H, a little bit of A or B uh, can leak onto the surface of the red cells, kind of passively absorb. So as a result of that, some antibodies can form. They can make anti-A and anti-B. Again, depending on what their ABO type is, they may not make anti-A if they have a small amount of A antigen on the red cells. Same thing with, an with anti-B for blood group B, genetically blood group B people. But these individuals very, very commonly have weakly reacting very mild and cold reacting anti-H as well as anti-HI. And most of these antibodies, though not all, most of them are clinically insignificant and don't cause problems. 
Finally, the Parabombe version of the mostly H-deficient people, these are the people that have mutated FUT1 genes, so th as a result, they make very little H on their red cells on the type two chains on their red cells, um, and uh, so they, uh, but they're typically non-secretors, so they have a tiny amount of A or B. Again, they, they, as I described to you before, they may make an anti-A or an anti-B depending on their type, but most importantly, most of these folks do make a strong and very well reacting at body temperature anti-H. So how do we transfuse these, these individuals, Bombay people and other H deficient people? Basically, if they've made that anti-H alloantibody, which reacts at body temperatures and causes a problem, that's a very highly significant IgM antibody that's capable of fixing complement and causing problems for the patient. So as a result, they need to see red cells that are H negative. So essentially they need blood from an, either another Bombay individual or their own autologous red cells. And really for folks like this, it is a good idea for them to donate blood for themselves when they're healthy, uh, so that should they ever need blood, um, they, they could get blood that is negative for the H antigen. What about the others? Well, those cold reacting antibodies, and some, again, I said, as I said, some people call those autoantibodies, auto or anti-big anti H or HI. Those are really common antibodies, uh, and you would see those in most people who are A1 or A1B if you really tested them and looked at, at cold temperatures. These antibodies do not react at body temperature. They are cold reacting IgMs. They don't cause hemolysis at body temperatures. So fundamentally what this means is that if you find someone who is H deficient, it's really important to care characterize what their antibodies are like. If they have that strong reacting anti-H that reacts at body temperatures, they really need H negative blood. They need blood from a Bombay individual. However, um, if they only have the anti-H or HI that reacts at cold temperatures, then realistically this is not a big issue for them and it doesn't cause significant problems. But again, you're going to have to take a look and see exactly what kind of antibodies that individual has. Okay, so we've covered a whole bunch of stuff. Um, again, here's our outline, the basic ABO antigen synthesis. We've described the Bombay phenotype. We've described two types of para-Bombay phenotype. The first, the H-deficient secretor that usually has non-significant uh, H antibodies, but then the mostly H-deficient non-secretor, uh, the mutated form of the H allele, and those individuals do have significant antibodies. Transfusion, as we've described, depends on how the anti-H is reacting people who are a Bombay will essentially always need uh, blood from another Bombay individual or their own. People who are para-Bombay, depending on which type, they may or may not, and it depends on what antibodies you see. Well, thanks so much for hanging out with me. I, I, I hope that this uh, has been useful for you. I hope that you're able to categorize things a little bit better now and you're not confused by B Bombay versus Parabombay because that tends to freak people out a little bit. Please give me any feedback that you want on my website. That's www.bbguy.org. Um, you can find this, this podcast in multiple different sites. As I mentioned here on the slide, I hope that you'll contact me before you use it for any presentations of your own. I thank you so much for hanging out with me. Thank you for all the times that you've watched these podcasts in 2014. I look forward to moving into the future and giving you more information that, that will be helpful for you. Thank you very much. Have a great day.